The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Experience gorgeous, lasting, high-quality hair color with Madison Reed. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com and get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit. Use code RADIO10. The pause in Blair's response that he was taken aback. Um, the British knew everything we knew about Al-Qaeda and the attack of September 11th. We shared intelligence with them. We continue to share intelligence with them more closely than any other country in the world. And the British knew that Al-Qaeda uh, had nothing to do with Iraq, that Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis had nothing to do with the attack of 9-11. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, September 15th, 2021. Bruce Rydell is a senior fellow in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution, where he and I have been colleagues for a good long time. He is also a long-serving CIA analyst who, at the time of 9-11, was working for the National Security Council in the White House. In recent days, he has published two articles on lawfare about new information that has emerged about the post-9-11 era. One involves the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah, the the Al-Qaeda operative first captured by the CIA and subjected to brutal interrogations by the agency. The other article involves Bruce's own notes of conversations with President Bush in the days immediately following 9-11, notes which show that Bush even then was fixated on Iraq's involvement in the attack. Bruce joined me in the virtual jungle studio to talk about the two stories, why we are still learning details of 9-11 20 years later, and what these stories mean for how the Bush administration conducted itself in the wake of the attacks. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 15th, Bruce Rydell with breaking 9-11 news. So, Bruce, I was not expecting in connection with the 20th anniversary of 9-11 to have kind of breaking 9-11 news, uh, uh, let alone uh, news that materially changed my understanding of when George W. Bush had come to uh, fixate on Iraq in the aftermath of the attack. So why don't you start by telling us uh, a little bit about the notes that you found? Uh, uh, What are they and how did you come to uncover them uh, 20 years after the fact? Well, uh, one of the uh, few virtues of moving is that you have to take those boxes that have been in the attic for 15 or 16 years Uh, and open them and figure out what are you going to do with the stuff that's in there? Uh, And that's precisely what happened. Uh, We moved uh, to a new house uh, and I went through boxes after boxes of old files and documents. And in one of them, I found my little pocket diary uh, that I kept in my, uh, inside my jacket. And I didn't keep uh, copious notes there, but I kept a running track record of what I I had done every day. I found it a useful way to jog my memory about things. So as I went through it, I came to the notations for um, September 14th. And it's read in my notebook that I was in the Oval Office that day, uh, along with President Bush, Uh, when he made a phone call to uh, British Prime Minister Tony Blair. 
For, and for those of our listeners who don't know, why were you in the, uh, what, what was your job that you were in the Oval Office with President Bush a few days after 9-11? I was a special assistant to the president and senior director for Near East Affairs. And Near East Affairs at that time also included Afghanistan. Um, I was a uh, holdover uh, from the Clinton administration uh, where I had worked for Bill Clinton in the same job uh, for the four previous years. Uh, when the Bushes came in, Dr. Condoleezza Rice asked me if I would stay on for another year in order to provide continuity. So I was in the Oval Office for the phone call, which is not unusual. The, the president always gets a um, oral briefing uh, before he gets on a phone call. He, he always has a written briefing ahead of time, but he gets an oral briefing giving him any up to the lightest minute pieces of news and stuff. And normally you would stay on and, and be there with him during the phone conversation in case he had a question or something that he needed help with. So in this case, as I noted in my diary, uh, he and uh, Prime Minister Blair start talking and in the first minute or so of the conversation, uh, President Bush says to Tony Blair, and we're going to have to hit Iraq too, hit Iraq really, really hard. And you could take, you could tell from the pause in Blair's response that he was taken aback. Um, the British knew everything we knew about Al-Qaeda and the attack of September 11th. We shared intelligence with them. We continue to share intelligence with them more closely than any other country in the world. And the British knew that Al-Qaeda uh, had nothing to do with Iraq, that Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis had nothing to do with the attack of 9-11, uh, that they were completely separate and distinct issues. Um, the prime minister pressed the president a little bit for evidence. You know, what evidence do you have? Uh, the president didn't have any evidence. Uh, the rest of the conversation went on as, as you would expect. They talked about getting ready to go into Afghanistan and what that would entail. But it was very striking to me that here, we were now three days after the September 11th attack and the president was already talking about going to war with Iraq. And then a few days later, we had a meeting with the Saudi ambassador, uh, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, um, who was a frequent visitor uh, to, the, to the White House, going back to the uh, uh, George W. Bush administration, um, uh, George H. W. Bush administration, excuse me. Uh, and in this meeting with Bandar, the president again returned this time several times to the question of Iraq and what we were going to do to Iraq and attacking Iraq. And of course, the Saudis would be critically important to military operations against Iraq because we'd have to base uh, much of the uh, invasion force in Saudi Arabia, as we ultimately did. Um, the Saudis were also very nervous about this. Uh, they knew that invading Iraq and toppling Saddam was the easy part. The hard part was, what do you do with Iraq the day after? How do you keep Iraq from breaking up into a civil war? And how do you keep the Iranians from taking advantage of that? But Bandar also pressed for evidence. Um, there wasn't any. Bandar was smart enough fellow to know that um, this was not the time to quarrel with the president over the future of Iraq policy. All that could come further in, in, in the days ahead. But he clearly took down the marker and the Saudis from that moment on were very nervous that the United States was going to go to war with Iraq and that the United States did not have a plan for what to do with Iraq uh, after it occupied the country. And the last note I would make is that a few days later than that, a King Abdullah of Jordan uh, came to the White House. Uh, King Abdullah had actually been flying to the United States on September 11th. Uh, and his 
plane was over the mid-Atlantic when the attacks came and all planes were diverted back to Europe or to uh, airfields in uh, Canada. Um, he had been diverted back to Europe. He was now coming. And like the Saudis, in fact, even more than the Saudis, the Jordanians were very nervous about the idea of going to war with Iraq and the potential that would lead to a, a Sunni Shia civil war in Iraq uh, with the uh, <coughs> Sunnis uh, getting the support of Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups uh, and the Shias getting the support of the Iranians. Uh, so I found here in September uh, 2001, on three occasions, uh, President Bush was talking to uh, foreign leaders about going to war with Iraq. Now, I know this is more detail than we've seen before, but I would remind, re I would remind uh, people that uh, Richard Clark, who was the special assistant for counterterrorism in the Bush administration, but wrote in his book, published, I think, you know, more than a dozen years ago, that on the day of the attack, uh, he was talking to President Bush leaving the um, Oval Office. And Bush said to him, I want you to get all the evidence of Iraq's involvement in this attack together as quickly as you can. And, and Dick was taken aback by that because there was no evidence of Iraqi involvement and none ever, none ever uh, came to the surface. There is no evidence of Iraqi involvement in the Al Qaeda, in the Al -Qaeda and the 9-11 attacks. So I'm uh, interested in how I, I remember Dick Clark saying this uh, and writing it in his book. And I remember it being one of the very controversial features of his book at the time that it came out. But I always interpreted it as a kind of fixation of the Paul Wolfowitz group and this sort of group around uh, President Bush um, that, you know, maybe Dick Cheney had some sympathy for, but that Bush at least at first, was pretty focused, uh, though he may have asked questions about Iraq, was pretty focused on Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda. And your piece made me wonder if, you know, maybe the fixation on Iraq was, you know, we've all blamed it on kind of Cheney and Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld, but maybe it was really George W. Bush's fixation as well. Um, what do you attribute it to? Um, and so you were with him in these periods of time when, when he is in the face of all of this evidence that we're dealing with an Al-Qaeda attack, convinced that there must be some Iraq link what do you think was behind that? Well, that, of course, is the $64 million question that we've all been wondering about for most of the last 20 years. Um, my, uh, my notion, and, and I'm, th I'm pretty confident I'm right about this, is that the younger Bush um, was very much fixated on the fact that Saddam had tried to assassinate his father uh, in the months after he left the White House uh, in um, 1990, 1993. Um, if you may remember, we discovered uh, in 1993 that the Iraqis were preparing a car bomb that they were going to use to kill President H.W. Bush when he attended the uh, ceremonies of, of, for the liberation of Kuwait uh, in 1993 as the honored guest. 
Uh, and the evidence was, was very compelling. We actually had the car bomb. Uh, and there were unique signatures about the car bomb that uh, indicated the Iraqi intelligence had built it because we had we had acquired a similar car bomb um, during Operation Desert Storm uh, from the Iraqi embassy in Abu Dhabi, where they were planning to use it to attack targets uh, once the war began. Uh, I think this I think this attempt on uh, his father's life uh, was very, very important for uh, W, who um, really, you know, uh, not only loved his father as, as good sons do, but deeply respected him and looked up to him and saw him as, you know, having been uh, uh, not just his father, uh, but his president uh, for four years in the the notion that he could be killed um, by the Iraqi dictator, I think, had very powerful impact on uh, George W. Bush's thinking about the world in the Middle East. All of which is completely understandable and yet does not provide a significant link between Saddam Hussein and Mohammed Atta or Ayman al-Zawahiri or Osama bin Laden. Um, one of the things that I've always been, you know, somewhat forgiving of the Bush administration because of the degree to which, uh, you know, the intelligence they were receiving on WMD was as flawed as it was. And I think it is, you know, possible to say, okay, they had, uh, you know, very confident intelligence estimates about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction programs and activities that in the wake of 9-11 was genuinely alarming. But again, that's a different issue from, you know, they were somehow responsible for 9-11. And I'm, I'm curious whether you believe that Bush actually believed this um, whether this was just the reflexive direction his knee jerked, or whether it was cynical and he saw a an opportunity to deal with uh, a, a long term U.S. enemy and somebody who he had a heck of a personal beef with um, in the wake of nine eleven was this delusional on his part or was it? Uh, cynical and manipulative. My view uh, is that uh, a considerable part of the Bush administration, certainly including the vice president and the secretary of defense, uh, wanted an opportunity to get rid of Saddam from the day they came into office, if not, I mean, you know, even earlier. Uh, that that was one of the reasons that they had run for election in 19, um, in, in 2000. Um, but prior to September 11th, there was no way to make that case to the American people or the American Congress. Uh, Iraq was contained. Uh, we had uh, you know, two no-fly zones. We had UN sanctions in place. Um, there was no prospect that those sanctions were going to go away. Uh, there was no um, cause uh, for a war. And I think that on the morning of September 11th, it dawned on quite a number of them that now they had the opportunity that they had been looking for, that this gave them the, uh, this would give them the green light uh, in the emotional turmoil that swept America uh, after September 11th uh, to go, basically do whatever they wanted on the military side. And that Afghanistan was insufficient to really appease the national trauma that uh, September 11th had created. You know, if, if you remember back to those days, I mean, America really was in a um, 
state of trauma. I think that's the best word to use. We had never anticipated uh, a terrorist attack on the United States would be as terrible as it was. And of course, it could have been far worse if the fourth flight had hit the National Capitol building. Um, the pictures of that would have made the World Trade Center look uh, as bad as it was, not as bad as the rotunda of the National Capitol crashing in. Experience gorgeous, lasting, high quality hair color with Madison Reed. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com and get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit. Use code RADIO10. You trust podcast hosts like me for a lot of things, for the content you consume, for the news, even for information about national security and law. But you shouldn't have to trust us about sleep, which impacts your life very directly. So if you're looking for ways to improve your sleep this fall, don't just take it from me. You should also trust the more than 2 million happy sleepers who are currently sleeping on a Nectar mattress. There are tens of thousands of reviews from real people who sleep on Nectar mattresses that you can read. Nectar is an incredible value for a quality product. A mattress this well-engineered and comfortable should cost hundreds of dollars more, but Nectar prices start at just $499. Join the more than 2 million happy sleepers who sleep on a Nectar with its award-winning layers of comfort and premium memory foam mattress that hugs your body and keeps you cool. Nectar is currently running its biggest offer ever, $399 in accessories. Visit Nectarsleep.com to get your new mattress today. You get a 365-night home trial, plus forever warranty, plus free shipping and returns, Shop from the convenience of your own home. Go to Nectarsleep.com. That's Nectarsleep.com. So that's a, a particularly cynical uh, way to understand it. I, I mean, just to put a fine point on it, I, are you suggesting that you know, when Bush said this to uh, to uh, Bandar and to Tony Blair, he didn't actually believe that Saddam had had anything to do with this. It was just he saw an opportunity to kind of settle national and family business, and he was going to take it. Uh, you know, of course, I can't. I can't tell you what. George Bush believed or didn't believe. Uh, I can tell you that from an hour after the uh, World Trade Center was attacked, uh, the CIA was stating unequivocally, this is Al-Qaeda. Um, and if asked, said Al-Qaeda has no connections to Iraq. Uh, and the CIA never wavered on that point. And nor did, nor did any other part of the intelligence community. There was nobody in the intelligence community who was leaking Al-Qaeda uh, to Iraq. Now, if deep down George W. Bush truly believed that, I, that's entirely possible to me. Um, but that's certainly not what he and the uh, principles of the... Uh, Bush administration were being told by their intelligence uh, specialists. So speaking of new news from the 9-11 era, you wrote another piece on Lawfare a few days uh, before the one about your notes about recent revelations concerning uh, a plot against Tel Aviv by Abu Zubaydah. Uh, so I'm, I, walk us through how this material became public, again, 20 years after the fact. Certainly. Um, the first Al-Qaeda operative of any significance to be captured 
uh, after September 11th uh, was a uh, Palestinian born in Saudi Arabia uh, who went by the nom de guerre of Abu Zubaydah. Um, Abu Zubaydah was uh, somebody who we had had our eyes on for several years uh, because he was kind of the um, logistics man of Al-Qaeda. Uh, if you were going to travel somewhere, uh, Abu Zubaydah got you your ticket and got you your forged documents so you could travel in alias. Uh, this meant that, that he knew an enormous amount about what was going on in Al-Qaeda, even if he wasn't actually a um, uh, planner of attacks himself. Uh, he was very much in the in the um, discussion about where people were going to go, what they were going to do when they were yet there, uh, and the links between them. Uh, he was captured in March uh, 2002. The first team to get there to debrief him was a team of uh, counterterrorist specialists from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. And the lead investigator on that was a Lebanese American named Ali Soufan. Um, Ali Soufan and I have known each other for, I don't know, 25 years. Um, Ali Soufan wrote a book after he retired back in, I think, 2012 or so, uh, about his experiences in the FBI. And he narrates the in the book that as soon as he started talking to Abu Zubaydah uh, in fluent Arabic, Abu Zubaydah blurted out that I'm working on a big attack, a very big attack. It's going to be as big as 9-11. In the book, Ali Soufan uh, was prescribed by the agency uh, publications review process, which he had to go through, just as I go through before you publish a book, from naming the name of the country where the attack was going to take place. So you, you have the details of the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah, but you have no details about where this attack was going to take place. And of course, once Abu Zubaydah told it to the FBI, we immediately shared the information with the country at risk and were able to prevent it from happening. Well, you're right. 20 years later... Before you go on, what do we know about the thwarting of the actual attack? Um, you say in the piece that it was stopped at the last minute. How, how advanced was this plot and what do we know about it separately from Abu Zubaydah? Um, that's a very good question. Um, most of, well, I would put it this way, uh, all of what we know so far about this uh, comes from the FBI debriefing of Abu Zubaydah. Um, and all of this, very importantly, was volunteered by Abu Zubaydah very quickly in the conversation. Uh, in fact, they stopped the interrogation uh, after about a half an hour because they needed to get this information to the host country. Um, so we, we do not have at this stage a lot of information from the Israelis on what happened next. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, a freedom of information suit uh, finally reached closure uh, in early September uh, 2021. Uh, the, um, suit, the suit uh, had uh, pressed the U.S. government to hand over Ali Soufan's handwritten notes of the interrogation, which uh, he had put in the archives. Uh, and the judge ruled that these notes had to be turned over uh, and made public. And it's in the notes, of course, that we, lear we learned that the, this, 
the country at risk was Israel and the targets were dance clubs um, in Tel Aviv, uh, all of which made uh, eminent sense. Uh, Osama bin Laden was very motivated by the Arab-Israeli conflict and Israeli-Palestinian conflict in particular. And of course, Abu Zubaydah was a Palestinian uh, who uh, was similarly motivated. So wanting to do something to strike Israel shortly after 9-11, if not coterminous with 9-11, made complete sense. Um, the Bush administration um, was not eager to have this information come out because as soon as uh, the CIA team got to uh, debrief Abu Zubaydah, they began using waterboarding and other torture tactics. Um, and as you know, uh, quite a lot of that was done to Abu Zubaydah. Uh, if the word got out that Abu Zubaydah had been talking uh, with no torture uh, and revealing uh, not just big secrets, but actual attack plans, uh, it would have called into question the whole logic of why did you need to torture this man if he was already talking, which is in fact the whole theme of Ali Sufan's book, um, the, the torture misdirected uh, the pursuit of Al Qaeda after 9/11 and and set back the counterterrorism efforts rather than enhanced it. Uh, the, the Bush administration, in particular Vice President Cheney, did not want that information to come out, so it was suppressed um, for all these years since then. Um, until this Freedom of Information Act suit turned out. Now, what we haven't heard from in the last week or so is any discussion of this issue from the Israeli side. Um, now, there must be Israeli, there are Israelis who know the details here, uh, but so far uh, they're keeping them to themselves. Do we know, I mean, other than that um, Ali Safan has said the attack was stopped. Uh, I mean, one possibility is that Abu Zubaydah, as you suggest in the piece, thought he was talking to the Mossad because um, Ali Sufan is native Arabic speaking. Um, so he blurts this out. He uh, inflates the degree of it um, uh, because he's trying to uh, either misdirect or or to uh, uh, you know uh, magnify his own role and importance, and actually the plot is not all that advanced or you know not even real at all. Do we have any reason other than his claim to believe that there was a particularly advanced plot in Israel at the time? Yes, I think we do, because um, Ali Sufan followed the, uh, you know, kept abreast of the investigation into the Tel Aviv plot. Uh, and he he read all the cable traffic going back and forth uh, as we passed the information to the Israelis. So he would have known what the Israelis uncovered uh, once we gave them the tip off uh, that started this uh, process going. Um, and there's, there's no reason to doubt that Ali, Suf, that, that Ali Sufan is telling us accurately uh, that the plot was fairly uh, well advanced and that um, it was close to, the bombs were close to going off. Um, I and mean, it's quite a dramatic counterterrorism success, both for the United States and for Israel, to have stayed completely quiet for 20 years, especially because Abu Zubaydah, who is still to this day at Guantanamo and, of course, was, uh, uh, you know, famously part of the CIA's uh, interrogation and detention, black sites, torture program, 
and was uh, equally famously, you know, they've been unable to try him at Guantanamo as a result of the treatment of him. I mean, he's been particularly prominent to have this kind of near miss of a major attack by him go uh, stay quiet for 20 years. It's a uh, rare that 20 years after an important event like this, we find news which is quite as uh, uh, newsworthy as this. Um, but there was intense pressure uh, to protect the notion that, that waterboarding was essential. Um, and this would have just pushed that all away. Um, I also have to say, um, you know, Mr. Sufan has demonstrated uh, exemplary commitment to the uh, principle of, of um, you know, not talking about things that he was told he couldn't talk about. Um, I'm sure over the years, uh, he was probably tempted, but he kept to his, uh, to his oath. And only when the information became available in a court ruling, uh, was he ready to talk about it. Now, interestingly, he talked about it to an Israeli newspaper and they published the details. Uh, the American press has, has shown much less interest in the story. Um, it's interesting. I would just uh, emphasize the point that you made because uh, about Sufan's discipline and not uh, talking about this before it was declassified because, you know, the larger fight that he had with the CIA um, over Abu Zubaydah has been very much a part of the public record even since before he published his book. Um, you know, that Abu Zubaydah was first interrogated by the FBI using non-coercive means. Then the CIA came in and uh, initiated the, the uh, uh, much more brutal approach. And Bob Mueller pulled Ali Soufan and the other FBI people out as a result. That has been known for a long time. And when the Senate did the uh, uh, the big RDI investigation, they, uh, the broad outlines here that, uh, you know, that Ali Sufan's investigations and interrogations of Abu Zubaydah were productive and, um, and that the, the most important things that he said came during those periods, not during the abusive uh, CIA interrogation. All that has been known what hasn't been known is that, you know, the matter was a piece of actionable intelligence against about a major set of plots uh, against Tel Aviv nightclubs. And so it's, it's a pretty dramatic um, capstone on the Ali Sufan Abu Zubaydah story. I, I, I agree with you completely. It is, um, uh, it's remarkable that this secret has been kept for 20 years. Um, the, as, as you say, we've known, uh, I mean, Ali Sufan's book is, is, I think, eight or nine years old. Um, it's actually been uh, reviewed twice by the uh, publication review process. Um, there's, a more, there's a more recent version uh, which has some of the formerly redacted material unredacted, but the even the new version does not speak of what country Abu Zubaydah was talking about. If you go back and read the book, you'll find it's 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 right at the beginning of the chapter about Abu Zubaydah that Abu Zubaydah reveals a major plot was underway, and we were able to foil it. So that part of the story has been out there for years and years. It's just the name of the country. 
um, that is now recently unclassified, declassified. So taking these two stories together, it seems to me that they stand for the modest proposition that there's still a lot of details about 9-11 and the post-9-11 era that we have yet to learn. One of them is, um, hey, we knew Bush was early obsessed with, uh, with Iraq, but boy, it was recurrent right after 9-11, a recurrent theme really close to his mind and uh, close to the center of his mind in a way that at least I had not appreciated. And the other is, hey, we knew there were some big counterterrorism successes following the uh, arrest of Abu Zubaydah, but you know, just how big and where we, we didn't know. Do you think this is a generalizable point that we're going to keep over the next uh, few years and decades, keep learning more dramatic stuff in this? Not that fundamentally changes our understanding of what happened, but that really continues to enrich it and provide details? Yes, I think there are, I think there are a number of, of things. I'll, I'll give you the one that, that always troubles me the most. Uh, in the summer of 2001, uh, the CIA was constantly warning uh, the Bush White House and the rest of the American government that an attack by Al-Qaeda was coming. Um, George Tenet, uh, in particular, literally drove around Washington uh, putting this message out. Uh, I heard it in, in, uh, in the NSC multiple times, and we saw the raw intelligence as well. And, of course, there's the famous... August 6 PDB that said an attack in the United States is coming. Um, but the odd thing is the CIA also knew that there were two Al Qaeda operatives in the United States uh, who had arrived in Southern California more than a year in advance of September 11th. And they had their true names. That information had never been shared uh, with the White House uh, it had never been shared, I think, I think quite late in the game uh, with the FBI. Um, had you had that information uh, and you'd given it to state and local authorities, well, we almost certainly would have arrested those two guys, and that would have unraveled the whole 9-11 plot. So the question I have, I've had on my mind is, what went, what went wrong? Why didn't why didn't the CIA pass that information along? I, I remember distinctly the day after September 11th, September 12th, talking with Dick Clark, uh, who learned of this few hours after 9-11. Uh, and we both said to each other, we never heard before of a single Al-Qaeda operative ever being in the United States of America. They knew that there were two of them and they didn't tell us. That's staggering. And I, I, don't, I don't think we've got the full story of what happened with that. And that, I think, is a story that still needs to be um, pursued. And I, and I think there are other ones as well. But that's the one that's, that is at the top of my uh, agenda of learning more. So the 9-11 Commission spent a lot of time and energy on that question and came up with a, uh, a, buff a kind of angrily befuddled, we just don't know what happened. Um, do you think we're ever going to learn it? That's a very good question. Um, the, I, I don't think this was George Tennant's mistake. Um, I don't know when he learned there were two, uh, but I, I find it hard to believe that he would have gone running around Washington, uh, literally uh, screaming, you know, code red, code red, uh, and not said, you oh, know, by the way, here's the names of two of the terrorists. 
So I think this is the answer to your question is somewhere down in the bowels of this of the uh, counterterrorism center in the CIA. Uh, there was some kind of foul up here. Um, now the, the people involved in that have never really come forward and spoken about it. Um, and and as you say, the 9/11 Commission review, which is you know, in, in almost every other regard, one of the most outstanding uh, investigations ever done by uh, a, a nonpartisan independent investigation into, a, into something like this. Um, this is the one place where I, I think you, you put it right. There's kind of a befuddled, we can't quite figure out what happened. We're going to leave it there. Bruce Rydell, uh, it's uh, great to hear your voice again. And uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode is the intrepid Ian Enright of Goat Rodeo. You should do your part to promote the Lawfare podcast. Share us on all the socials, rate us or review us wherever you found us. Buy the merch at thelawfarestore.com. The Lawfare podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening. Experience gorgeous, lasting, high-quality hair color with Madison Reed. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com and get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit. Use code RADIO10.